So if you have high LDL cholesterol, that does not mean that you are going to die sooner. And there was a study that just came out two or three months ago showing that. But if you have high LDL cholesterol, that does mean that your chance of getting diagnosed with cardiovascular disease goes up. Okay, the chance of diagnosis goes up, but the chance of dying sooner does not go up. Dr. Darren Schmidt, how did you find carnivore? <laughs> so it goes back to uh, being in college. Um, I wanted to be a doctor of something. So actually I was pre-med, but then I surveyed a dozen students and doctors of medicine about their profession and nobody encouraged me to go into medicine. So I looked at osteop um, optometry and podiatry and then I spent some time with a chiropractor so I decided to become a chiropractor because I grew up on a farm. I was used to manual labor and using my hands. So then I um, went to school and I actually had started studying nutrition in 93 and I started chiropractic school in 94. <clears throat> and in 95, 96, I was taking nutrition classes, but I spent a lot of time outside of the classroom, like at seminars. I went to two seminars a month for two years in chiropractic school. And there's one doctor that I saw at a seminar and he was talking about a variety of like old school nutrition tricks. And um, it was amazing. So I decided to be a chiropractor who focused on nutrition. Graduated in 97. In 99, I went to a seminar uh, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation. So learning from Dr. Price <clears throat> and what he discovered in the 1930s, he traveled the world for 10 years, looked at 144 different tribes. And I learned at that seminar that one of the values of dairy is the fat, like there's good fat. And that was a new concept for me. Like, okay, you mean, wait, there's some fat is bad and some fat is good. Some is good. She's like, yeah, some fat is good. So I decided to go low carb there in 1999. And um, I started my practice two years earlier. And um, since then, I've only purchased like five loaves of bread. No rice, no pasta, no, you know, grain, pastries. N none of that. I had six pops, soda pops in the year 2002. And that's the last time I drank a pop. <clears throat> so, in, so I was low carb from 1999 to 2015. In 2015, I learned about ketosis. I was cycling in and out. And then in 2018, I started the carnivore diet. I saw Dr. Sean Baker on the Joe Rogan podcast. And I started um, August of 2018, the carnivore diet. So when I look back at the three varieties of low carb diet, the carnivore diet is the easiest and most fun and most flexible. And I still check to see if I'm in ketosis sometimes, maybe once or twice a year, I'll check my blood. And um, sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. <clears throat> 90 to 95% of my calories are from meat. And I'll have some, uh, some fruit sometimes. But in, in 2019, I was super hardcore carnivore lots of fatty meat for a year. And I went to the gym a lot. I was putting on weight. I felt great muscles, you know, but then my clothes got too small. So I needed to lose some weight or which is cheaper than buying a whole new wardrobe. So, but in 2019, during that time, I really craved sugar once a month. So I'd buy five apples or five bananas and just have them in one or two days. And I could feel my muscles get stronger. Cause I was, you know, just lacking glycogen. And so eating the fructose helped, you know, store up the glycogen in my liver and muscles. So anyways, um, some people, you know, they go carnivore, straight carnivore for years and decades and they're totally fine, but not, you know, everybody's different. So that's how I found now I have, I'm a chiropractor focusing on nutrition since really 1998 and, um, applying this to my patients. And I, there was also another diet, the, the blood type diet. And people ask me about that all the time, even now. I first learned about that 20 plus years ago. And I decided, well, if I, if the low carb diet doesn't work, then I'll rely on the blood type diet, which I've never done. I, the low carb is, you know, the most genetically correct diet, you know, meat based. Now, some people have various conditions such as prostate cancer. You want to do a pescatarian diet. And some people have autoimmune conditions and, you know, candida, whatever. So there's, you know, different um, 
types of food that they should avoid based on their condition. But across the board now for 25 years, it's been a low carb diet. As a chiropractor focusing on nutrition, um, is this something you recommend to your patients? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've been telling people low carb for a long time. And initially, people were really shocked. We're talking 20 years ago. And there was a book I had on um, eating. Uh, it was Dr. Mercola, grain free diet or something. And people would say, well, how am I supposed to stop bread? And I would just point to that book. And they were, they hated it. They just hated the idea of not having grains of like, you know, eating low carb. And, you know, even though the Atkins diet was popular around 1997, but now, you know, people are more um, open to eating low carb. Now, again, a lot of people that see me currently, they've seen all my videos, on, not all of them, but they've seen my videos on YouTube. They know what they're getting into. And um, so I, a lot of people go low carb and they lose 20 pounds and they come and see me as a patient, you know, so it's easier now than what it was 20 plus years ago. Did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you contrast for me then you, you said specifically you're focusing on nutrition. Um, what, what is the other kind of chiropractor? So in my the other kind of chiropractor is the reg the chiropractor who focuses on like physical therapy or rehabilitation. So you got regular chiropractors, they adjust the spine. Then there's two, there's more than two specialties, but the two big specialties are nutrition and then like physical rehab. How, how does a chiropractor decide which way they're going to go? Like you, you took classes in nutrition. Do, do all chiropractors do that? Or is that your, you chose to specialize that way? Yeah. All chiropractors take nutrition classes in school and there is a specialty, um, postgraduate, uh, clinical nutrition type degree chiropractors can get. Um, but I, you know, wanted to be, I was pre-med before. I entered chiropractic school, like I want to heal the body, pretty holistic, right? It's just the idea of like head to toe, how do you get people better? And I kind of was born holistic, I guess. I mean, I was raised on a farm and you got to be somewhat holistic to plant a seed and watch it grow for a couple months and then harvest it. So you got to think like long-term. And so I had that viewpoint, like how can I get somebody better, fully better, as cheap as possible, as efficiently as possible? with no side effects and that's by nutrition. So that's my focus is I, um, I solve complex chronic illness using only diet and supplements. That's my specialty. And, you know, just to go back to when you're talking about your, your history with the low carb and, and so forth, I, I think it's pretty awesome that you can actually remember the year that you last had soda. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I'll um, tell you, the years I bought bread, let me tell you that. Oops. In um, 2006, I bought um, three loaves of bread. In <laughs> 2016, about two loaves of bread. And those are for experiments for digestion, you know, constipation. Like, what would this do? You know, like, yeah. I, I used to live in a moldy house that caused constipation. I also lived in a, I worked in a moldy office for 13 years. And that just about killed me, it hurt my heart. So I just always experimenting with my diet and supplements. When you have a patient come in, um, have you ever managed to move them over to a low carb or a carnivore approach and found that more than the problem they came to see you with has corrected? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I remember one of the biggest, um, hardest things to heal is um, tinnitus, the ringing in the ears. So in 2015, when I started keto for myself, talking to my patients about it, I started getting patients coming back saying, oh, my tinnitus is better or my tinnitus is gone. And I didn't say anything to anybody for a year because I couldn't believe it. Like I tried all these pills and whatever. And then I found, um, you know, Ivor Cummins on YouTube. He interviewed Dr. Brooklyn, who ENT is specialist and he said ketosis is the best solution for tinnitus so then you know also you know like a thumbnail uh toenail rash 
you know, like those kind of things go away. And then people, you know, just on and on people, uh, ketosis is the best thing for Raynaud's disease where people's hands get really cold and they turn purple or white. So yeah, it's, it's surprising. Like, you know, I'm looking for this result. Like there's a, is, there's like a limit to my expectations. And then I have people do this diet and then this, this, this limit keeps expanding and expanding and expanding, you know? So it's like, I can, and I kind of, I can predict what people will go through once they start the diet. Uh, my experience talking to people about um, being on a, on a ketogenic carnivore style of diet is, yeah, it's just, this is why I started, but then this happened, this happened, this happened. What kind of feedback do you get from the patients? Is it like, uh, I, I'm, I can just imagine some people coming in that had never heard about this approach to nutrition before feeling like they just discovered some kind of magic potion or something. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of the way it is. You know, <clears throat> I have a several uh, older women, I'm going to say in their seventies and on the carnivore diet and they come in the office and it's like the visits are, the visits are boring because they have no fatigue. They have no other symptoms and they don't need a bunch of supplements. You know, I have, I carry like 900 supplements in my office. So we're addressing, you know, cleaning, detoxing the body, helping the liver function better, lymphatic system, nourishing the organs. We can do all these great things with the supplements. And when people are on the carnivore diet, it's the meat based, low carb diet. Like that's the foundation. And so, so if they're sick with, let's say they're toxic with, you know, a rerun test, we see plastic in people's bodies and, you know, mold and mercury, you know, metals and stuff. So, so people will come in with that diet or, you know, I put them on the diet and they feel better. And then um, if they plateau, then I know that there's more I have to do with the supplements. You know what I'm saying? So I can see that I'm expecting this much improvement with the diet but if they only get this much, I'm thinking, okay, what am I missing? You know, let's do some more lab tests. Let's do some whatever other testing and find out the next barrier within the cells or within the organs that need to be cleaned out with the supplements. So that's been really helpful to, to you know, the more patients I see, the more experience I get, the more I, I know what's missing. So how, how does this go down with your peers? Um, because uh, I I feel like there's almost there uh, even if we think something like Atkins low carb keto is much more accepted now than it was twenty years ago, I think there's still quite a bit of there, there's still quite a bit of pushback against this in the medical profession. Right. I would I would think uh, how does that go down? So that's a really good question. So chiropractors love low carb and I've, I've taught, oh yeah. So in the last four years, I've taught eight to 12 times a year traveling around the country. And I did that, you know, between 2006 and 2000 or 2005, 2015. So 10 years, I taught eight to 12 times per year. And so I've taught thousands of people, mostly chiropractors, some acupuncturists, et cetera. And when they come to the seminars that I deliver, they like to hear about low carb. And then I've, um, I just presented a month ago to 175 medical doctors in New Orleans talking about low carb keto carnivore. And it was the, a debate and there was a vegan. So I spoke for 45 minutes. He spoke for 45 minutes. And then we had a one hour debate with questions from the audience. And I'd have to say I won that debate. And I think a lot of people wanted me to win that debate because they know that, you know, the vegan, um, community has more mental illness than any other dietary group. And that's been well studied with surveys and research. So when you say my peers, it's all the holistic people, right? So this group of 175 medical doctors, they're very holistic. It was the International College of Integrated Medicine. Great people, fantastic group of people. I've learned a lot from them. It's the people, the people that don't like it are the standard cardiologists and medical doctors and dietitians online. Now they don't approach me in my office, you know, it's just online. Right. And so I can name names 
and I go after them because they say the most ridiculous things like Mediterranean diet is the best diet. Are you kidding me? Absolutely not. hundred percent not. And when somebody says that, I know they're an amateur and they know they don't practice nutrition. They might practice cardiology. They might practice surgery. You know, they might be some kind of a specialist in the medical profession, but if you're in nutrition and if you're actually practicing it to increase health, you would never say that. Now you can practice nutrition as a dietitian or nutritionist, and you have to talk about the food pyramid because that's your, you know, the American food pyramid, that's your um, license. You have to, or the American Diabetic Association diet, because that's your license. And they don't get anybody well. We're, we all know that. So the question is, who, is, who are my peers? My peers are the holistic practitioners, whether it's a nurse, uh, acupuncturist, MD, DCND, um, on and on and on. I love them all. And then, and then the people who are standard conventional um, USDA Mediterranean diet, those are not my peers. They do not have the clinical experience I have. They do not have the knowledge. They don't get people well like they should be getting people well. They need to get people like diabet you know, diabetics need to get into ketosis. Without a doubt, type 1, type 2, doesn't matter. You got to get them into ketosis. And the best study for that is the Verda Health Trial which was published in 2019. Yeah, you've heard of that. And Dr. Steve Finney kind of was one of the spearheads on that. And like, there's never been a trial that's had greater results. And, and I've challenged the, you know, I'm going to say standard MDs, find a study that shows any other diet that's better for weight loss, getting off meds, you know, diabetic medications, lowering blood pressure, lowering inflammation. Just show me one, you know, it's got to be a trial. It can't be a survey or observational study. And nobody's done that. And you can Google Dr. Steve Finney quack or Verta Health trial debunk. Nobody's done it. And here it is five years later. But yet the standard cardiologists, et cetera, they never talk about Verta, but they'll debunk some other kind of a low carb trial or some other low carb study or whatever. But it's like they don't touch Verta. They don't want to talk about it because you can't beat that trial. So 265 people for two years, 74% retention rate, 30 pound weight loss or 35 pound weight loss. So anyways, um, you asked me about my peers. <clears throat> so when I talked, when I, and I've been blocked by a couple of people, standard medical doctors, and it's like, you, and I'm thinking like, you can't say these things that you're saying because you're so wrong. Even though PubMed agrees with you to some degree that the Mediterranean diet is the best diet. Mediterranean is low animal protein low fat, high carb. And that's, there's a study, there's actually a trial where they compare the Mediterranean diet with the standard American diet. They had equal outcomes. So when you're promoting the Mediterranean diet, I will argue that you're promoting the junk food that we're already eating. It's still high carb. Some of it's processed, you know, the American diet is 57% processed food. Whereas the Mediterranean diet might be less processed food, but yet the carbohydrates, and the, and the fat and the protein are the same, right? Very high carb, very low protein, sad, sad, low protein, like disgustingly sad, and then low fat. So anyways, there's my answer to your question. Yeah, um, a very interesting answer. And um, as I'm somewhat active on Twitter or, or X, I, I, I think I've probably run into some of those cardiologists. But For sure, um, yeah why why is it this way like is this just the the cardiologists the the traditional mds like why why are they so fixed like this is it they just don't want to rock the boat or or is it something else because there's the reason why is because there's missing information back in the 1960s we all know that harvard was paid money to attack fat and the sugar industry, you know, was being promoted, but that's not, you know, a lot of low carb is talking about that, but there's way more to it. Okay. So the question is why does a standard cardiology and all these other doctors um, say the things they say about saturated fat and carnivore and all that stuff? Well, it has to do with LDL, LDL cholesterol. So if you have high LDL cholesterol, that does not mean that you are going to die sooner. And there was a study that just came out two or three months ago showing that. But if you have high LDL cholesterol, that does mean that your chance of getting diagnosed 
with cardiovascular disease goes up. Okay, the chance of diagnosis goes up, but the chance of dying sooner does not go up. Right? So there's a little nuance there. Right, I know. So here's the deal. Okay, I had this debate one month ago, vegan versus carnivore on stage, 175 doctors in the audience. I accepted the invitation to do this debate nine months earlier. So I had nine months to study, 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 study. And I did, and I took a ton of notes. And what I found was that LDL is for the immune system. This is super interesting. So LDL is an opsonin. And what that means is it prepares a meal for one, like in original Latin or Greek, an opsonin prepares a meal for one, like a chef. So LDL prepares bacteria or virus or parasites to be consumed by macrophages. So your LDL can go up because of an infection. And we already know that LDL can go up if you're a lean mass hyperresponder. LDL can go up if you're fasting. LDL can go up if you're ketosis. LDL goes up on junk food. LDL, LDL goes up on meat. Doesn't mean LDL is the cause of heart disease? No, but there are randomized control trials where the conclusion is LDL causes heart disease. But it's not true because you can be lean, lean mass hyperresponder, high LDL, you don't have heart disease. So LDL is just another component of this big picture. Every chronic disease is multifactorial, including heart disease. Okay, but what I, so I did a video back, I think it was October, where I talked about LDL as part of the immune system. And I had like 40 studies and I went through them. It was like an hour long video. And I talked about infections raising LDL. And I have patients who have chronic infections. I have this one guy infection in his right here. He could feel it going down behind his left ear, down his neck, spots of pain and, and pressure, left chest, left torso. And he's been on a carnivore diet, keto, hardcore for a year and a half. He's doing better now than he has in five years because the LDL went up so high, it, the lab couldn't even read it. And then, then now it's down because he's getting better. We have a patient with cancer. Um, it's all cured now because she went on a, a raw egg diet. <clears throat> She's eating 12 to 18 raw eggs a day. That was three years ago. Her All of her cancer is gone. Metastasis is gone. Her LDL was like 306 or something, 308. Now it's down to like 240. You know, so she's getting better. And the LDL was part of that, her getting better. So if somebody has heart disease and they have the, the typical, the man has a typical belly, high blood pressure, um, you know, fast pulse, out of breath, swollen ankles, you can't blame that on LDL. Right. It's more, it's got, it's so much more than that. So you got to straighten up the diet, go low carb, get into ketosis, fix the drainage pathways, the kidneys and the liver and the bloated belly might be candida. Fix that. There's probably parasites in their gut. And that's another factor that all of medicine misses. They miss candida. They miss parasites. They're, they suck when it comes to chronic bacteria, chronic viruses. So in 2007, I figured out parasites really well. And I started getting patients to poop out parasites, whether it's this long or four feet long or even teeny tiny, they look like pieces of rice coming out. That was 2007. Every week I have a new patient, new person saying, oh, look at this picture. This came out of my butt, right? It's in the toilet. And they show me a picture. Since 2007. And now it's 2024. Every single week. And I had um, one person brought in a jar with this worm that was wrapped around in, inside. And um, I called up University of Michigan Hospital, which is not too far from here. I said, I got a parasite, patient brought it in, it's in a jar, can I bring it in? And you can test it and find out what it is. And they said, no, you're a chiropractor, we don't accept it because you're a chiropractor. I'm like, okay, professional discrimination, that's fine, totally fine, that's your prerogative. By the way, how many parasites did you identify each week? And they said 400. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot. That's a lot for Southeastern Michigan. And they said, no, it's Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia. I'm like, wait, seven states you in Ohio, eight, <laughs> eight states, you only find 400 parasites 
a, a week, it should be thousands and thousands because that's, you know, 50, 60 million people right there, whatever, whatever the number is. So again, that's just an, an example of how medicine, they suck at parasites. And, and when you get, and they, they'll give you a drug and these parasites come out, right? And the drug might be one day or, or 10 days long. But I've had people with supplements, the supplements work really, really well. I've had people eliminate parasites for a year, right? So like initially there's none, then they start coming out. Three months later, there's a lot. Every time they go to the bathroom, six months later, it starts to decrease in the quantity. And then after a year, now they have no parasites left. So that's an example of like, and mold. Let's talk about mold. So I was in that moldy house and moldy office. And with the office, I sued my landlord and my mold attorney, she was the first attorney in Michigan to bring mold to the courts. That was 1999. And um, she goes, you need to have a mold lawyer, a mold doctor. And she goes, but don't go to U University of Michigan Hospital because they don't know anything about mold there. And I was like, oh, okay. So I went to a doctor who, he's part of the American Academy of environmental medicine. Okay, but like 40% of homes have enough mold or buildings, 40% of buildings, at least in the United States, have enough mold to negatively affect the people living in that building or working in that building. All you need is, this is drywall, right? These, these homes are made out of paper. This, these walls are drywall. You get them wet within 24 hours, they're growing mold. So you gotta find the source of the water intrusion, then you gotta cut out the mold, then, I got, then you got to clean the area, change the carpet, change, you know, change these drapes or, or whatever that would be absorbed, you know, having absorbed the spores. So now these are the infections that medicine is missing. Parasites, mold, candida, chronic bacteria, chronic virus. And then there's an infection in the heart called nanobacterium sanguinum. And that's so super small. And it was only discovered like, when was it discovered? Um, 2013, maybe. So it's pretty new. And it's like 50 times smaller than standard bacteria. And um, and it's it's in the literature, but like medicine doesn't look at it because it's pretty still new and there's no drug for it. So these are all the infections that I think are causing high C-reactive protein, you know, high LDL, and it lowers your HDL, it raises your triglycerides. But beyond that, there's um, the high carb diet, grains and sugar, and then you get abdominal fat or visceral fat, and that in, in itself is inflammatory. So now the body is treating that fat as if it was an infection, right? So now you got the high LDL, the high triglycerides, it, the whole looks like diabetes, looks like um, heart disease. And then another factor, which I figured this out a couple, two and a half, maybe three years ago uh, from other doctors, infections in the teeth. So cavitations, bad root canals, and they're in the jaw, and you can have no symptoms, gum, no gum recession, no cavity, no pain, no redness, and yet you have this raging infection in your mouth, and it goes into your heart, and it causes placking, and then you have a heart attack. Or for women, it goes into their breasts, and they get breast cancer. And there are documented you know, uh, research and identifying the organisms and all that stuff in thousands of cases. And this goes back to the 19 teens with Dr. Weston Price. And he had people that had, he pulled bad teeth out that were infected. And then he put them under the skin of a rabbit. And the rabbit got the same disease as the person had from the bacteria in the teeth. So again, another example of an infection that could be causing heart disease, placking, heart attacks, high LDL. I'm just saying like standard cardiology is, is so missing the boat on how to get their patients well, because the patient could have an infection and they get diagnosed with high LDL and put on a statin. And the infection is not even addressed, not even looked for. What they need is a dentist or what they need is an immunologist or what they need is a dietitian to get them off the junk food. Or they go to a diabetologist, an endocrinologist, and they say, oh, you have diabetes. Well, wait a minute. I've seen people with high um, glucose, high A1C because of an infected tooth. I've seen it in my office. I'm a chiropractor, you know, like this, it's my love to treat people with nutrition. And, you know, in, in the last 30 years then, you know, studying this and then practicing it since 98, I see things that other doctors don't see, even though it's their specialty. And the reason why I see it is because number one, I don't take insurance. 
patients pay me cash. Now they already have insurance. They're already paying for insurance. Now they come to me and they spend more money and I have to get them well or else I won't have a practice. Why would somebody come to a doctor who doesn't get anybody well? Well, if you've got insurance and the doctor takes your insurance, you'll go see him or her and maybe you'll get well, maybe not. But I have to, I've elevated my, my demand to be a better and better physician as you know, I, is because I don't take insurance. I stopped taking insurance in 2005. So it's, now it's been 19 years, no insurance. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why I see these problems that, that medical doctors who specialize, they need to be seeing it. Now, the other thing is I see such a wide variety of people because in my paperwork and in my, you know, legally, I supply nutrients and I help the body get better. That's the simplicity of it. I don't treat disease. I do not treat disease. And why would I treat a disease when, you know, that's, that's a specialty, but I'm treating the whole body, fixing the whole body up. And then these problems tend to go away. So, but anyways, I, so I see a wide variety of people. So I have an MS patient right now and her, her left leg totally stiff, right? I put her on supplements for parasites. She's been pooping out parasites. Now she can move her leg like five inches one way, five inches the other way. Her hip and her knee and her ankle, they're all starting to flow a little bit. So am I a specialist in multiple sclerosis? No, not at all. I'm a specialist in getting the human body better. So I have a lot, I have a lot of variety, a variety of uh, stories about these weird conditions. I, one time I had a woman, a girl, <clears throat> she still comes to the office <clears throat> and she was born with like half a brain. Okay, the initial diagnosis was not given to her until she was like 10 years old. When I started to see her, she was six. She couldn't walk. She couldn't crawl. She didn't speak. And I put her on supplements for her brain. And within six months, not only could she start crawling, but she was standing up and walking under her own power in six months because of the supplements that I gave her. And these supplements actually came, they, they were invented in the early 1950s. And the company is called Standard Process. So, like, am I a specialist in neuro, you know, degenerative, you know, cognitive, um, congenital brain disorders? No, not at all. <laughs> you know, I feed the glands, I feed the pituitary, I feed the brain, I feed the nervous system, the myelin sheath, the, the good fats, you know, that kind of stuff. So, I just, throughout my career, I just have all these wild stories about, you know, weird things going away because I have this broad knowledge about how the body works and how to fix it. And so then, then again, we have people with, you know, common fatigue and muscle aches and fibromyalgia. And so what's causing that? It could be Lyme disease. So you go to a doctor, they test the Lyme with the Western blot test and it comes back negative. Then what? Well, they come to me, I find it because I use different forms of testing. And again, I don't use any drugs because mostly Medical doctors give an antibiotic for Lyme disease, but actually herbs do a really good job of, of helping the body with Lyme. But you have to prepare for that. You have to get the parasites out. You have to get the toxins out. And then you can go after Lyme. So I have a whole system. And yeah, but I have a husband and wife right now. He's got uh, fibromyalgia and she's got horrible anxiety around her heart. And they're both doing fantastically better. And it's been like six months or something, you know, and it's work right? It's diet and supplements. And they come to see me initially once a week and then every other week, every three weeks like that. So I see patients locally and then I see people out of state also. We do phone wow. call, video consultations. No. So you mentioned antibiotics. Um, in the US, would you say that antibiotics are overprescribed? I think in Japan, they certainly are. Well, when I read up on this, um, antibiotics are overused in cattle. And I do think that sometimes doctors don't give antibiotics when they should. I've seen that. I had a patient once with um, super high triglycerides. It was like a thousand or something. And I think he had an infection. So I said, go see a medical doctor, test the white blood cells, go get an antibiotic. So that's what he did. He went to the doctor, high white blood cells, did not give him an antibiotic gave him a steroid and a statin drug. And I'm like pulling my hair out. Like it's an, obviously it's an infection. 
Now there's other people who, I know a, a woman, she wasn't my patient, she was a friend. She had a, an infection and she went to the doctor and instead of treating that with an antibiotic, he gave her Prozac because she was complaining. So I've seen all kinds of a wide variety of problems with you know the prescription of drugs. Now, a lot of people, they've taken antibiotics over and over again, let's say six times a year because of chronic sinuses, for example, or chronic ear infection. Well, the antibiotic's not working, right? It did work for a few weeks, but then the problem came back. That means they need more drainage. They need the lymphatic system to drain out the liver. Maybe they're constipated. There's got to be some flow of the crap out of their body. So, so again, that's where supplements come in. And the lymphatic system, I treat that. I help everybody's lymphatic system. Like that's so important. That's the sewer system of the body. So what the, pro the bigger issue, the bigger problem is that medicine is missing information, missing data. And that data comes from the supplement companies. It comes from um, uh, physiology and knowing how biochemistry works inside the body. And instead of trying to block normal physiology, like block the pain receptors and block the um, other, you know, the dopamine receptors, whatever, all the drugs block, block, block. Instead of doing that, you want to get the crap out of the body. You want to clean. That's what you want to do is you want to clean. Okay, so proper diet, clean the cells, and then people feel better. Instead of Mediterranean diet, drug, 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 drug. See, that's that's what we're doing now. It's a total mess. So when I, com when I communicate to standard medical doctors on social media, they hate me for saying this. Then they block me. And it's like, dude, I'm trying to teach you something, but... That's their system. They're stuck in a system that quite frankly, it sucks. And they're controlled by their license, which is controlled by big pharma, which, which controls the licensing boards, blah, 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 on and on. So as a chiropractor, I'm so thankful to have this license because it's so wide open. I can use all these nutritional supplements and, and diet. And that's like how you get 90% of people better, right? You can add in some red light, add in some sauna, exercise, of course you know, all that other stuff, but to get into the body and fix up the biochemistry, that's where it's at. You take pills and you want to, you know, supplements and clean the body. And I, I have people put things topically, if they have a chronic ear, ear problem, you know, topical treatment at the ear, essential oils, for example, clean the sinuses out with Navage or a neti pot, water pick, clean the mouth out, that kind of stuff. In your practice, when you have someone come in, how will you be advising them? If someone comes in with, you know, they're on a standard kind of diet, how do you advise them to get started and, and make changes that are going to be beneficial to them, whether that's diet related, taking supplements or, or something else? So the way I approach that is baby steps. And like I said, my main two tools are supplements and diet. So the, di the, the supplements, that's easy for them. Just take pills, right? Three times a day, you take the pills. That's easy. And then when it comes to the diet, um, whatever changes I make, I make sure that they can do that until the next visit. So I'll see people more frequently. Like I'll see them once a week or every other week. And we make these small changes with the diet and they do, they do the change. Then we make the next change after that. Instead of you know, I know some, some of my colleagues, they'll do a one hour visit once a month and they talk with the patient for a whole hour about what to do with their diet. I think that's too much. So my visits might be 15, 20, 30 minutes. And then we just talk about one or two things that they need to do. And then I show them, you know, go see this video, go see this website, you know, use this website as your foundation for your education. And then, um, so that's how we, we approach that. Now, some people, like I just had a conversation last week with a patient. He's got IBS and they put him on supplements for parasites. He's doing so much better. And he said to me, well, he goes, I don't feel like I'm in charge. He goes, I'm, I, I have to trust you. I have to take your pills. I'm like, but you, you know, and that's true, right? But I said, your diet is awesome. It was awesome from day one. The first day you talked to me, and you said that you were afraid to make any changes. And I said, don't make any changes. Just keep it the way it is and let the supplements do their work. We might make changes later with your diet. But again, it's all monitoring, right? That's, a, that's an important word that I use often is monitor. 
we're monitoring for progress. We don't want the progress to skyrocket like this. We want it to gradually increase and have and be stable. You know, like there's no 10 day, you know, vacation weight loss program. There's, you know, it's like over the course of many months, we're going to look for these parameters to improve, you know, like keep it simple like that. And I like the idea of the shorter, the shorter visits and more touch points that kind of would definitely, uh, I feel like if that was myself, that's going to keep me on track much better than, you know, getting a whole lot of information once and then trying to work it out from there. Yeah. Um, and I've been, I've been the patient of a holistic doctor with these big meeting, you know, one hour long and, and run these lab tests. And, and I was like, Oh my God, I couldn't do it myself. And I'm a doctor. <laughs> yeah. It just becomes overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Schmidt, how can we get in touch with you? Um, do you have a website, YouTube, that kind of thing? Yeah, my YouTube channel. Just search my name, Darren Schmidt. And it's the one with 160 some thousand followers. And I'm on TikTok. Again, just search my name. And that's pretty much it for my social media outreach right now. My website is thenutritionalhealingcenter.com. Awesome. So I'll, I'll link to those below. Um, Dr. Darren Schmidt, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story with us and giving us some insights into how you're helping your patients. Thank you. You're welcome, Dave. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it.